Um, and we are uh, arriving to our last communication, um, after which we will have some uh, discussion time. Um, I want to present here Ana Sofia Santos. She's in the image now. Hello. Hello, can you hear Ana me? Sofia. Yes. You yes. Can. Yes, good. And uh, you can see my presentation now. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, perfectly. Ah, perfect. So, well, you have there the title Landscape Built by Local Communities, Governance and Property Rights in Portuguese Mountain Areas. Very interesting, also, very important uh, subject issue. So, we are all, we are all here to, to listen to you. Thank you, Ana Sofia. Thank you, Martin. Um, and uh, actually, it, it's uh, good to be the last because uh, I heard the previous ones and this one entangles <laughs> and, and overlaps in some issues, which is uh, good. Uh, actually, Philip should be presenting this because this is more his area, but he's teaching classes, so he cannot. <laughs> so I'm presenting um, this, uh, this team, uh, which uh, is something that we have been uh, addressing uh, like for a few years now um, mainly passing from theory into practice so um, at the first stage a few years ago we started um, looking at property rights and governance structures in mountain areas here in portugal uh, uh, and now we are at the phase where we are actively collecting and cultural is, is also allowing us that data to eventually support some of the theory <laughs> that we have uh, looked. Um, so as a starting point, and this is all about cultural because this is our main starting point, the fact that uh, there is a depopulation problem in rural areas, um, whereas the, the urban population is rising. And these are data for Europe. Really. Most European regions or countries have this problem, uh, a few of them more than others. And our countries that are involved in this project, we uh, feel this um, with, uh, you know, a very personal touch. <laughs> it touches us personally. Most of us live in rural areas, so we know precisely what we are talking about. Um, at the same time, Apparently, and, and eventually, uh, uh, Sofia, do you have a PowerPoint to share? I'm sharing it. No, at least I cannot see it. Okay, Martin was just uh, now. Yes, we see your first uh, slide at least. Have you Not passed anyone? Yes, I was like on the first now. <laughs> I don't know what is happening. You are, you are, and now you, I see it. Did you pass? Yeah, but this anyone? is not in presentation mode. This is, uh, you know, the PowerPoint. So uh, I... that is what we see now. You are, uh, we see your cursor. Uh, yeah, you are... exactly. But if I put it in presentation mode, then also, also, I think also we can, we will see it. Yeah, but then I, if I do this, you see it? No. Uh, not yet, but no. still, maybe Not still, yet, you uh, didn't. Okay, let's do it like this. No worries, I don't have any any animation, so let's be practical. <laughs> yes, yes, we, we see it perfectly. Okay. So I'm going to do this. So I was in on this uh, slide. So I was saying that, you know, depopulation, the problem of the de people coming out of the rural areas, we have low population in rural areas. And at the same time, we have uh, like this paradoxical reality where everybody everywhere is now talking about rural and farming and sustainability and environment and all is very beautiful and all is very nice. <laughs> uh, but somewhere in between rural areas continue keeping losing people uh, and urban areas continue to push this bucolic idea of everything is perfect if you live in, in close to the environment, but nevertheless, cities continue to have more population and, well, you know, we are in this cycle. So these are interesting times that we live in. Um, concerning property rights, what can we say about property rights? Um, there is, uh, uh, usually we, we relate very easily with private property. Okay, this is my phone, it is mine, you know, if, if I want, I share it with somebody, but it is mine. Um, and 
what about land? Land is a bit more complicated. In fact, we can also have uh, private land. It is my land. I can close it. Um, but in some cases, in, in, in European uh, rural areas, we have what is called common lands, uh, territorios comunitarios in Portuguese, or baldios. Uh, Spain has it uh, as well. Greece, mainly in Mediterranean areas, common lands are very common. <laughs> And common lands uh, have this idea. If you ask somebody who is, you know, who who is not related to it, common lands have this idea of of it's nobody's land, which actually is not correct because common lands uh, are not open access. So in in 1999, Heller um, shared this idea that uh, it was the tragedy of the commons that all common land was was um, condemned. Uh, to failure because uh, if it was everybody's land then everybody would use it as they fit and then the land would you know this would lead to overuse and depletion and ultimately to uh, uh, ending all the resources of these areas which actually hasn't come to true uh, because this is not actually the case uh, common lands as we know it these uh, common territories they actually are private, but it is a very specific private property because they are owned by the village. So everybody living in the village has the right to use this area, but somebody coming from another village does not. So it actually it is a private property, but it's not a complete private property because it is actually not of one person, it is of a, a group of persons. So within this matrix, we have, you know, what we could call completely open access, which diff very hardly we have, and the opposite, which is completely full exclusion. Both of these could eventually lead to some kind of either over or underuse. And this is more or less the theoretical part, okay? Somewhere in between there is limited access, limited exclusion, and, you know, sole or individual ownership, which is what we are more used to have or to deal with. Um, concerning the, 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 okay, concerning land use, because it is different. One thing is property rights of the land, and the other thing is the way the land is used. So land use can be defined, if you want, uh, on the way humans use the physical or ecological properties of the land, of the area, the social and economical purposes for which the land is managed. It can be housing, farming, timber extraction, grazing, conservation, whatever. Okay, so this would be land use. We have, for example, some areas, com sorry, completely uh, di um, directed for um, conservation. Okay, these are protected areas. You cannot there. You cannot put animals farming in there. So these areas are for the sole and exclusively the exclusive use of nature if you want <laughs> but you can also have mixed areas for example most of our Rede Natura throughout Europe has a lot of mixed areas so you know it is a mixed uh, use of conservation but also housing farmer uh, grazing etc so within all these this problematic problematic you know uh, property rights. How do we use land? How can we use land? Will we exclude? Will we include? Etc. We have our rural areas, mainly mountain areas. That is the the how to say the the, the pool of of definitions and land uses and property rights that these areas are embedded in, with, uh, and it can be complicated to address how to manage these areas and how to eventually uh, create pol policies to manage these areas and not impose these to people. Uh, so our research focus uh, is actually precisely land use and land access or land property uh, within the common lands in Portugal, mainly and specific. And you can see from this map, uh, common lands in Portugal are very strictly strictly related to mountain areas. So we have a big, big concentration of common lands or common territories 
here in, in Trás-os-Montes, where we live, uh, but also in Jerez, and, you know, where uh, Serra da Estrela and mostly mountain areas. Very few common lands exist. Some uh, some exist here in Serra do Caldeirão, cá em baixo, <laughs> sorry, down here, but they are very, as you can see, they are very uh, low amount of common lands south um, of Portugal. So we will divide uh, this uh, presentation or the way we present this in two uh, cycles, if you want. One cycle before the, the civil revolution here in Portugal uh, in 25th of April in 74. Um, and then after 1974, 1986, because the period between 80, 74 and 86 was a, you know, adaptation period. So, and then what, ne what, what next? What, what are we going to from now? Uh, if we pick up on the traditional um, villages that we have in mountain areas in Portugal, this is what we see. We see, um, you know, a close um, housing agglomerate. After and close to the houses, we have this area where you can see is uh, mainly composed of high value pastures, nutritive pastures, um, improved pastures, seed pastures, people, you know, seed these pastures sometimes, and then you have all the rest. So all this area here is common land. This is private land, okay? Each person will have one, two, three, or more of these grazing areas, what we call lameiros. And of course, very near the houses, we will have, as a colleague was talking about, but we will have the gardens, if you want, you know, the, 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 um, farming areas where they put the coverage, the potatoes, etc. those would be even closer to the houses than these grazing areas here. And this, this type of structure is seen throughout the country. This one, the first one that I show you is, was, is here in, in Trajmont, where uh, Martin was uh, last month. Uh, this one here is in Jerez, but it is very similar and we have the same structure. So we have the houses, the small gardens, then we have pasture areas close by. These are private owned, okay? And then we have common. Common lands are usually um, made of bush areas, forest areas, and eventually some grazing areas, some mountain pastures can occur far away from the villages. They are not very common, but actually they can occur in some areas where, where you know, land could, could provide mountain pastures. And then again, if we go down, the same structure. Again, this is again in, in here in Alvão. The village, the grazing areas, you know, Lameiros, and all the rest here, mountain, uh, forest, and bush areas, common lands. The only place where we still see the structure, but it's not uh, so rich in terms of mountain pastures, is in the center area, in uh, Serra da Lausanne, um, some parts of Serra da Estrela where due to um, the, you know, the decline of, of the mountain, uh, the, the, the villages were very tight and uh, located in, in, in the mountain and there were actually no space for good and big grazing areas. So animals would graze mainly on bush areas or small pasture areas. One problem that we have now is that these uh, villages are most of them without people <laughs> and also without cattle. So in the first cycle before the, the, the revolution, what we had was that we had uh, organic societies. These villages were very active. They would rely, they would depend, you know, on their surroundings. They would highly depend on the common areas. Common areas were seen as uh, the place where they would take their animals to graze some species, and I mean, actually all species, some of them more often than others, that's where they would put their animals to graze once the pasture areas needed to rest to promote crop rotation in these pasture areas. That is where they would go and pick up what we call mato, which is bushes to make up the bed of the animals. That's where they would pick up um, uh, wood, 
to, you know, to the fireplace. So all of these villages were very dynamic and we would have, um, you know, the center of the village, the houses, the small gardens, and then we would have the grazing areas and all the rest. And this was all very highly, highly organic. And, you know, there was an, an equilibrium. People would clean forest areas, animals would clean forest areas, people would graze, uh, animals would graze the land, animals would leave, uh, manure would improve pasture and soil uh, nut nutrients, etc, etc. So this was a very dynamic and we had what we now call very short food supply chains. So, I mean, the village was self-sufficient, basically, in general terms, okay? But obviously we know that this was not uh, only good things. These villages, most of these villages were completely isolated and you know, they would not have uh, contact with other villages or even with urban areas. It is, these were hard times uh, to live in. Okay, so this is not all, all good and beautiful. Um, so eventually at, that st at this stage, we could say that this type of land use and land property, we would have this limited access. So people from the village would have access to the, the places, to the common lands, but people from outside the village would not. And this is where we could locate at this time. After the revolution, uh, things changed and the governance also changed. We started to change. We started to uh, get more people in the cities. We start to um, <laughs> intensify, if, if you want, um, food production. Um, and necessarily, that is, of course, all of this started much earlier with the Industrial Revolution, but concerning the, the, the use of the land, um, this is where we started to see the, a bigger difference, you know, in population movements and population leaving these villages, these inland villages and moving towards cities. Um, and then all this, this um, change started to happen. Um, at now, what we have is that we, within these common areas, we have economic activities that are practiced there and that they are not practiced by the villages or from the families that live in the villages. Very often, uh, these, these common lands, the comparch, which is the, 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 how to say, the organ that is um, responsible for the governance of these common lands, um, often uh, sells wood to, you know, big buyers, uh, rents land to put eolics. Um, and also we have a lot and a lot of nature tourism that, and cultural tourism that we were just talking about that is actually highly dependent on these common lands and on these villages, if you want. And they don't necessarily, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't leave the proper income to keep this village alive. So, in fact, we had a declining of the relationship of owners with land. If, you know, in ancient times, we would go and pick up wood from, for, from the common area because, you know, it is there and I go and I pick it up today, uh, most surely, eventually, I would call some timber and I would call a timberman and say, put wood here so that I can lit up my fireplace. Sometimes the timber that he puts here is not from around, it's from somewhere else. So there was, we assisted a decrease of the social control of common lands because it was very tightly linked to, you know, this social articulation with the population living in the village. So the situation that we had basically today doesn't exist anymore uh, unless in some, you know, it still exists, but not with the, the dimension that it was. Of course, that this brings problems and we know a lot of these problems. Uh, we have land abandonment, farming uh, is decreasing, this type of farming, of course. We have loss of biodiversity, we have loss of vegetation short sources, domestic animals, we have desertification in some of these areas, and highly important as well, loss of rural landscapes. Um, and this is a problem, and it brings problems per se. So we have seen a rise, a big rise in forest fires throughout Europe, and this is nothing new for most of our countries. 
Uh, and this will become worse. If we gather to all of this climate change and all the issues that, you know, extreme climate events will continue to happen more and more often, then we have, I would say, the perfect storm eventually in some of rural uh, European areas. At the same time, uh, we have on the other side uh, a complete globalization of the food uh, that we eat. So we can go to any supermarket and buy beef coming from Brazil, coming from Argentina. We buy pork coming from China. Uh, we buy soya coming from Brazil and the United States. Um, and we don't buy eventually we can but eventually we don't buy as easy because it eventually it can be actually more expensive meat or vegetables that are produced in our country close to our village covid19 has showed us actually that uh, short chain supply uh, short su supply chains are more prone to difficulties than these big supplies we saw and we see at this moment because we are shutting down again um, <laughs> the municipalities and putting people home and we see that small markets again are becoming the first ones to be closed restaurants and these will buy will be the first ones to buy these short chain uh, products so COVID-19 also showed us that, you know, short circuit uh, markets are very feasible. <laughs> um, so we have this big industry commodity change uh, exchange uh, throughout the world. Uh, and somewhere in the middle of all of this, there we, we are in the rural areas. So we passed from that small scheme that I show, showed you earlier, this one here. Uh, we went from this to this, okay? So this is now <laughs> the total food supply chain. So this is big differences. I'm not saying that this is bad, I'm just you know, saying what it is. Um, at this moment, we live concerning common use, uh, property rights, a limited exclusion situation. So basically now um, we don't exclude people from using these common areas we may exclude some type of activities uh, and paradoxically we exclude more easily persons from the villages to do some type of actions for example uh, putting a fence to have animals grazing on a closed area that is not possible to do but if you have an eolic you know a, a windmill you can put a fence around the windmill so that people will not go in there so this is also interesting to see how we went, you know, from from this to this um, and uh, eventually where will we go now? So uh, the structure has has changed. We have the forest fires. I'm sorry, I, I'm repeating myself a little bit here. Um, after big, big forest fires event that we saw throughout Portugal, Spain, Greece and Italy uh, and also other countries, the United States very often as well. After this extreme catastrophic uh, forest fires or rural fires, now we are starting to again uh, talk about fire prevention instead of only fire fighting. Okay, And when we start talking about fire prevention, we see that what we lack is precisely you know, this structure to be again organic and interlinked. Uh, so we see that we lack people in these areas. We lack animals in these areas. Uh, so how, how to work this? Okay, how, how to do this? Uh, these are some pictures uh, here. This is the um, Alvadia. You should have gone there, uh, Martin, where, but the, the fog <laughs> didn't let you go, but you would go this. This is Alvadia. It's up in, in Alvão. And again, we see the same structure. You see here the housing, we see the Lameiros, and then the bush areas, commons. But in Alvadia, we still have people and we still have uh, cattle grazing. You can see them here. But we also see these were lamators. These areas were pasture areas. Okay. And you see now they are not. They are bush areas. So this is what happens when, you know, animals stop grazing and people stop 
reseeding these areas. And this, in a long, medium, long term, would, you know, will occupy all Alvadia, all this village. These pictures are from Florac. We were in Florac a few years ago. And I was funny and I put them here because they have exactly the same problems. Florac is, is uh, located in a mountain. Of course, Florac is not a small village. It's, I mean, from what they told me, it is a small <laughs> village of 3,000 inhabitants, but they have the same problems. They are very up in the mountain and they are isolated and they have the same structure. They also have the you know mountain pastures and they are seeing again the same issues, the bush areas coming in and closing in on the village. And of course, forest fires are an issue as well. And in the middle of all this, now we have the, the, the new cap, which is just, you know, it has been discussed. The first, the first draft is, is here. And they say that the future is rural. The social objectives for the next cap uh, are very focused on rural areas and how to uh, the dynam dyn put dynamics in these abandoned areas. So now we talk about, again, having a fair income for farmers that live in these areas, food health, um, you know, all the, all the, the, the pillars that support uh, this new cap. And with forest management as well, we are pushing forward and forward more and more the use and forest land use and management instead of firefighting. So are we going back? Uh, do we want to go back? Uh, is that what we want to? Uh, or do we want to have a mixed system here? And it is our opinion that a mixed somewhere in the middle would probably is probably where we are going from. Uh, and the road is actually, the path is actually what we are starting to, to do with this, with cultural and of course not, we are not pioneers, but we are, we are on, on the road on that, which is, you know, try not to lose the cultural heritage that we have in these mountain areas that are so widely um, disseminated within the, the, the type of, of culturalities that we have uh, from, you know, picking up potatoes the traditional way. Uh, this is, this is, this was this year here in my village, but this is Tininho, it's his name. When Tininho dies, and Tininho is 70 years old now, when Tininho dies, which will eventually happen, all of us will, uh, nobody else has cows and nobody else knows how to teach cows in my village, you know, to work the land. So pictures like this will disappear, at least in my village. Um, this these, this um, flock has about 200 goats, but it's the same. The, the, the um, pasture is about 76 years old. Uh, so <laughs> today is very cold here, but it, we, it is not yet winter. In winter time, it snows, it fogs, it's terrible. And he still goes out every day with his goats. Um, so this is not easy. Uh, will we be able to put animals uh, with some touristic purpose? Um, I think that would be, and that can be a, a way. These animals, these are horses. These are Garano horses, and they are grazing in a pilot experience that we have uh, to control bush areas, to see if we you know, keep, can maintain bush low uh, and prevent, in this way, some forest fires, or in this case, rural fires. But... Okay, there has to be some economic income from the people that have these animals there. Uh, if we manage to, you know, promote some type of, let's call it, let's call it, and I'm just, you know, putting things on the air. Let's call it, call it, uh, ec ecological tourism, if you want. Okay, come and see. These are animals. This is their grazing pattern. This is their feeding behavior. You know, they are happy. They are outside and they are eating something that we cannot eat. And they, at the same time, they are giving us ecosystem services. They are preventing forest fires. Um, this could be a way. This is another example. Terra Maronesa, it's, uh, again, when we, you, you, you should have go and meet Avlino. Um, this project is very related to the Maronesa uh, beef cattle, which is here uh, of the area, a local breed. And they are 
promoting the meat, of course, and the production system, and also all the cultural rural heritage attached to it. This was a meeting that they had online, and as you can see, these are all all very elderly people, and they have them around the fireplace. This was like two or three weeks ago, and they were just, you know, telling about old stories and old uh, things that happened like 20 years ago and how they would manage the animals and etc. It was really interesting. And this type of initiatives can help to bring or to keep life in these areas. These are more pictures, more things that we can do. This was um, uh, um, an example we had. We invited a few people of several different areas and we made a, a one day tour uh, starting in Perry urban areas, more or less like we did with, with the cultural visit, starting in peri-urban areas and then going directly up into the mountain because there's a big difference despite the, the physical, uh, the kilometer is not that far, maybe 15 kilometers, but 15 kilometers up the mountain makes a huge difference. So to, to have, we, this can also be a type of tourism and with income for the populations and for the, the facilities that we visit, for example. So in some ways, uh, the policies seem to be pushing us to, you know, going back, not necessarily going back, but picking up on a lot of the things that we did uh, a few years ago and put again uh, a, a holistic view on what is sustainability and including land and people in this sustainability because uh, somewhere along the way we lost it. So what we propose is uh, a mixed governance model, if you want, a mixed institutional arrangement, much more complicated than, you know, the one that was earlier showed that would, you know, put up property rights, sustainability, demographic control, democratic, sorry, control, le legitimacy of the populations at the local, national, European, world level, and, you know, looking at biodiversity, carbon sequestration, and all of that. So it is a much more complex model, but for us, it is, you know, the only way to go. How to put it forward, we don't know. It will take long. Uh, but at least we need to start addressing it and pushing it forward in some way. So cultural, and I know I'm talking for us, but <laughs> nonetheless, uh, is is a, a very good uh, project for us because it allows us to, you know, start moving towards this this type of of approach. So thank you. Uh, in all the different languages <laughs> that cultural has, I don't think I forgot any. And I have finished my presentation, Martin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ana Sofia. Very interesting.